June second, Lourdes University, Wilfrid Laurier, uh, 2012. We have uh, the next speaker now is Dr. Abraham Westfeld, and he has completed his doctoral thesis in political science at University of Quebec, de Montreal. And formerly, he was with the diplomatic office of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and is an author of the documentary study on Sabra and Sakina. I'm going to speak today on the nation state and the Palestinian nation. Oh. Yes, of course. And with the follow up, we have a small documentary after his uh, presentation. Not yet. Um, okay. After the uh, presentation. Well, here's. Uh, you can play it through the other computer on here, through the computer in the console. No, this is. Sorry, so it's What you're receiving is the yes, yes. That's the uh, the short version of uh, of this uh, here. So it's it's a very complex uh, matter to deal with. So uh, basically, what I'm addressing here is the grand debate that has endured over a number of years between what is called the two-state solution and the one-state solution. And the, uh, the flaws in the debate, uh, the fundamental flaws in the nature of that debate, which uh, is evident in, in terms of the impasse uh, that we have endured in this conflict, uh, not only since the negotiations uh, have started and not only since the debate uh, over, the, over those matters has started, but uh, ever since the conflict began, now, what, 65 years ago? And uh, ever since the, uh, the uh, provocation began in the founding of the uh, Zionist movement in 1897. So we're discussing here uh, a paper that I had presented uh, in part to the uh, Anasha National University in uh, Nablus, Palestine, when I was working there in the fall time. So uh, this is actually the first uh, complete presentation of this paper. And uh, it's uh, addressing the, uh, the nation state and the Palestinian nation in the sense that the Palestinian nation is a people and the nation state being addressed is the state of Israel and the contradictions between the two and the contradiction between the concept of nation as a people and the concept of nation as a state. Mm -hmm. Now, the matter of the character of the Zionist state of Israel is what I designated as has been now put on the table for the consideration of the world as the Jewish State of Israel, as stated by Prime Minister Netanyahu at the United Nations General Assembly. Previously, it was the Foreign Minister, Edder Lieberman, who presented a resolution to that effect in the Zionist Parliament, or the Knesset, although it was not supported by the Prime Minister at the time, and yet, he used the term in his UN presentation. And it is also a term that is used by uh, the uh, American President uh, Obama. This is indicative of the problematic character of the concept, since it is an obvious contradiction to the actuality of the Israeli citizenry, who are composed of Palestinian Arabs, <coughs> as well as Druze nationality and the Bedouin nationality, to a significant degree that is to the degree of about 20% of the population. Furthermore, the Jewish nation state concept is in contradiction with the actuality of the greater proportion of the Jewish people who do not live in the state of Israel and are therefore <coughs> not its citizens. That is to say that, according to uh, Wikipedia, 67.9% of the Jewish people do not live in the state of Israel. In effect, the majority of the Jewish nation is non-Zionist by definition. 
by the definition of Zionism itself. The claim to have formed a Jewish nation state is therefore a declaration of a dictatorship over the Jewish people by the Zionist state. This is precisely what is put into effect by the Zionist parties in Jewish civil society throughout the Occidental countries, where, for example, the Canadian Jewish Congress was recently dissolved to form a single organization with the B'nai B'rith organization called the Center for Jewish and Israel Affairs. The concept of the nation state itself is a mere invention of the European Reformation, which sought to achieve national independence from the Holy Roman Empire under the various Protestant nation states, beginning with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The German philosopher Hegel commented ironically on the matter by complaining that the United Ger German provinces should not be considered the German nation state, since it was only Prussia that was racially pure enough for him. Evidently, the notion of a nation state has an exclusivist, racist, racialist basis that does not tolerate any other nation other than that of the emerging national bourgeoisie. And therein lays the seeds of the various territorial wars waged on the European continent, ranging from the wars over South Lorraine territory, extending to the first and second European wars, and culminating in the Holocaust of the Jewish and Roma peoples model of a nation state had its consequences for the national minorities in particular who were isolated, forced into assimilation, and subsequently expelled as in the Spanish Inquisition and later on in the Holocaust. In reaction to being placed in such a context, the minority in question comes to consider its options and diverge into two historical tendencies. One being the struggle for integration by means of civil rights not only individual, but collective rights as well, since it became apparent that individual rights were dependent upon collective national rights. The second course of political action undertaken was the replication of the prevailing nation-state model as a separate entity, and this became codified as a theory of Zionism in the Jewish political culture. This replication of the initial oppression followed the thesis of linear periodization as the dominant historical paradigm, which was considered inevitable and so historically justified. In Marxist theory, this is known as historical materialism. This paradigm is parallel to the proposition of a nation like other nations found in the Sefer Torah, that's the Old Testament, which is adopted in place of the monotheistic deistic authority. As in the European pattern, this paradigm conceived of itself as a colonial project, and so sought its sponsor among the prevailing powers, lacking a fatherland of its own. The first option of integration was embodied in the Jewish Bund movement, which developed a constitutional proposition for national cultural autonomy, but within the context, unfortunately, of the nation state. The contradiction is apparent, but failed and, uh, and as a result failed to take root in either Poland or even in revolutionary Russia. The Marxian concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat did not allow for the national autonomy of any particular worker's social formation. The previous rejection of the federal principle by the expulsion of the anarchist Proudhon movement from the first international removed such a possibility from consideration. Thus, the Jewish Bundes direction was destroyed, first by the Marxist parties in the expulsion carried out in 1903 from the Russian Social Democratic Party, and then exterminated by the Nazi party, leaving the Zionist parties in a controlling position of the Jewish political culture uh, subsequently. In face of the Zionist project of a Jewish nation state of Israel, the options available for consideration remain the nation state or the Federation of Peoples. The nature of Israel at the time of its founding was not clearly defined to be what the Zionist project claims to be. The national character of Israel was not endorsed by the USA in the letter of recognition by President Truman in 1948. 
in that letter, the words the Jewish state were crossed out by Truman himself and replaced with the words the state of Israel. It may thus be considered illegal for the current administration to accede to the giant Zionist demand for the recognition of a Jewish nation state. Even the Prime Minister of, of Israel, Netanyahu, refused to endorse that resolution when it was introduced to the Parliament of Knesset by Lieberman. And yet, he uses the concept for ideological purposes. It is ingrained in Zionist theory as such, even if it is not legally codified, considering the apparent contradiction with the social composition of the Israeli citizenry itself. The liberal democratic notion of inclusiveness of all citizens as equal to one another is in depth direct contradiction to the notion of the nation state. In effect, Israel is not the democracy that it claims to be for this reason as well. In addition to the fact that uh, it is not representative of the Jewish people. What would a federation of peoples actually be or become is the consideration that we are left with when faced with the contradiction in the obsolete in character of the nation state concept. Considering the intertwined composition of the populations, cohabiting in the land of Palestine, originally Canaan, there is no possibility of carrying out the separation principle of Yabotinsky, the uh, original Zionist theoretician, <coughs> which, uh, uh, which has its, as its logical consequence the wholesale ethnic expulsion and segregation of the um, opposing nationalities. The limits of such a strategy have been reached and condemned by the greater part of the world. This was apparent in response to the presentation of Muhammad Abbas to the General Assembly on September 23rd of last year. Military force has little effect before the cascade of babies that continue to propagate in all the Palestinian lands. The state that is known as Israel is in effect now the entire territory of Palestine and would be divided with great pain and for only the immediate relief of the Palestinian population still residing in this territory. The seven million Palestinian refugees dispersed without the rights of citizens throughout the Arab lands are impatient to return even while the Zionist state refuses to even consider their existence. Considering the social integration of Palestinian and Israeli population in cities such as Yaffa and Akka, one may perceive the character of federation as it may very well be in the near future. The formula of a democratic secular Palestine or of an Arab Palestine are of limited value in terms of providing the mechanism for a constitutional proposition that will actually provide an alternative to the notion of a nation state and serves to offer a liberal version of the same. To reformulate the actual content assumed by such formulations, one is obliged to resort to the principle of federation in which the national character of each nation concerned is preserved, but not to the detriment of the other. In the liberal democratic proposition, the majority rule criterion destroys any such mutual confidence since its consequences is the domination of one nation or another. As as the majority confers, confers superior rights. <coughs> the matter of federation in the common land of Palestine Israel is said to be, the dis to be uh, considered by a constituent assembly of direct democracy with the delegations of each national cultures, civil societies, institutions being represented. After all, it is civil society that exists above and beyond the state. Palestinian nation exists even without a state, and the state that does exist has lost its legitimacy and credibility before the world. The enduring character of civil society is expressed as the assembly, which should remain as the permanent upper house of each nation's self-governing political apparatus. National cultural autonomy ensures the necessary cultural tools of survival while not infringing on the same reciprocal rights the other nations that coexist in a unified society. What is called the two-state solution has been named as well 
the Geneva Accord, the Camp David Agreement, the Arab League proposal, or the Tala Agreement. This uh, two-state solution fails for various reasons. One, the interpenetration of populations, including the colonies in the West Bank, and to the binational municipalities that exist already. Also fails for the compatibilities of the separate sovereign authorities and their claims. Thirdly, the democratic threat of the Israeli, the so-called democratic threat of the Israeli-Palestinian citizens. Four, the failure of the right of return of the Palestinian refugees to their original properties. And fifthly, the fact that uh, this two-state solution is actually in an ideal that idealized abstraction that has no concrete uh, validity. It, it, it has, has nothing which can actually sustain it, you know, as a, as a proposition of uh, separating two nations within a territory that are inseparable. However, as a transitional program to a federated no state solution, which is what I'm proposing, it is has some uh, diplomatic validity, since it is based in uh, the recognition of the Palestine National Authority as an independent member of the General Assembly, which is up for consideration for purposes of negotiating Palestinian national rights as an equal bargaining partner. So in that way, the recognition of the Palestinian state by the General Assembly would have a beneficial effect upon the process of continuing such negotiations. But a solution as such, if we are to use the word, remains out of the reach of a two-state solution or the one-state solution. And we have to look into a more sophisticated form of constitutional arrangement, which uh, can be summarized as the no-state solution. Um, we have uh, a discussion, and then uh, we have a, uh, a short documentary which I made together with a Palestinian filmmaker in Annapolis, Palestine during this fall period, which uh, can be shown afterwards, which uh, illustrates uh, in practice how Jewish-Palestinian collaboration along these lines can be achieved. But uh, now uh, we begin with, uh, with uh, your uh, questions and objections. <laughs> Yes, Danny. Hey, sir. Uh, well, a hundred years ago, uh, Palestine was ruled, of course, by Turkey, and it was far from democratic. But uh, a feature of the rule was that each uh, community in those days, marked mainly by religion, uh, Christian, uh, Shiite, uh, Sunni, uh, and in the different branches of Christian, so on were treated by the, the, um, the governing power uh, separately. In other words, they were, for, of course, most of the population was on the land in villages of one coloration or ethnic coloration or another. So it could be done, and even in, in, but even in the cities, uh, the, the Turkish authority would deal with um, Armenians, say, through uh, the, the, the uh, Armenian religious uh, uh, religious leaders. Um, well, anyway, it, what uh, Dr. Weisfeld is proposing sounds a little like that, except uh, with democracy. Uh, I, I'm querying the workability of that in an urban uh, in an urban setting. Uh, in the uh, Ottoman Empire, there was. Of course, you know, in the uh, Oriental world, the nation-state concept never had any footing. The nation-state concept was a European phenomenon. In the Oriental world, where you had multiple nations occupying the same territory over immense periods of historical uh, uh, existence, you had a different sort of an arrangement, you know, as Danny mentions. You had various uh, social formations that were recognized by the prevailing authority. So there was a recognition of collective identity. However, there was a centralized authority nonetheless. And the national minorities were recognized as a collectivity 
and given a certain security and protection by the uh, kingdoms or the caliphates, uh, but they were also uh, placed in a uh, caste apart from society as a whole, and there was a name for this, dimni, in which they were uh, given a certain uh, constitutional status of a dimni, uh, named, uh, given this name, in which they had to uh, pay a special tax to the caliphate in order to gain the protection of the caliphate in that society. Now, in terms, relative terms, I mean, it worked to a better extent than the, uh, than the existence of the Jewish people in Europe under the nation state. In effect, uh, the Jewish people were protected in the Arab world, uh, even against the Nazi occupations of, of the Maghreb. The Jewish people were protected, and there was a, a very small percentage of the Jewish people who, were, who perished in the Holocaust Whereas in Europe, the percentage of uh, Jewish people who perished you know, varied from 90% to 40% as in France. So, I mean, there is a certain sort of precedent established, you know, which would lead to the Federation of Peoples, as I am proposing, and that, is con that, is, um, that has a, a certain historical precedent which, will, which uh, is amenable to the proposition of a federation of this character. However, one has to be able to establish a true federation based upon a principle of reciprocity. That is, irrespective of the proportion of a given national entity, it has to have reciprocal rights with the other national entities within a federated society. In other words, they have to have equal status, even if they don't have equal weight. The proportion of each nation within a society is irrelevant except for the allocation of resources, scarce resources, water, land, etc., which is allocated on a proportional basis, of course. However, in terms of collective rights, one has to have the guarantee, constitutional guarantees of reciprocal rights so that there is no caste system. This a federation is not a caste system. It is a different conception entirely. But how can you do that in cities? It's done already. Haifa, you have 50% 50, 50%, you know, no, of the populations. Have, they're not a federation. Yeah. In municipal level, they have they are obliged to operate under such uh, constraints. Whether they achieve so entirely is another matter, but they are obliged to cohabit. And they do. There is no violence in Haifa. Is it not problematic to uh, continue the federation where or to develop a confederation which is based on ethnicity, uh, does that not exacerbate the conflict? Would it not be more conceivable in the long run to envision a society that was uh, inclusive, democracy based, and multi ethnic, in some ways like Canada? But right in Canada, we don't divide up certain groups based on ethnicity and, and then tying that to their representation. Would it not be better to try to create a democracy of equality of all within a unified state if you want to go in that direction? And, and, uh, and, uh, and giving, of course, minority rights to everyone in terms of the practice of whether it's religion, the religion, language, ethnic, uh, cultural traits, and so on, but within a political, have equal rights for everyone in, in that respect, a multi-ethnic approach. Would you that with that? This is a reference to everyone that is on an individual level, which is uh, quite different than the uh, sense of collective rights that right. is being discussed here. We have you know, established cultures here with long traditions which will uh, refuse to give up their collective identities, their national identities. Therefore, we are compelled to consider national identity as a fundamental constraint. Canada, if it's to be taken as an example, has not been able to substitute individual rights for collective rights. And Quebec still insists upon its uh, distinct character. And in fact, the uh, Parliament of Canada has been compelled to recognize the Quebec people, Quebecois, as a nation. By all parties, this is a unanimous or near unanimous resolution of the Parliament of Canada, which recently recognized that the Quebecois are a nation. Of course, there was no rights ascribed to this nation. There was no sort of uh, 
constitutional provision provided for this nation, and of course it is regarded as superfluous, you know, by the Kitakwa people themselves. Because politically it doesn't change anything. That's right. I mean, one can enshrine those kinds of cultural guarantees, even, yes, as Quebec has, and I can say you, those are cultural guarantees, essentially. But what you want is people to be able to live in peace, practice their own religion, their own uh, cultural identity, uh, no matter what that may be, and live in, again, live in peace and harmony, raise their kids together, whatever. So it's a matter of defining what the collective rights are that are required by each of the contending parties. Contending, uh, these collective rights include uh, language, religion as an option, um, education, educational system, and self-governance. But not so, territory. Ah, uh, territory is a matter of uh, a matter of uh, negotiation. You see, national cultural autonomy as a, as a political principle, as initially proposed by the Jewish Bund for the existence of the Jewish people in Poland and Russia, Lithuania, did not include uh, territorial rights. But it was assumed, because under the uh, Russian Tsar, there was a territory that was uh, allocated to the Jewish people and was actually a bandistan. It was called the Pale of Settlement. And that's where the Jewish people were congregated by default. So you could extend the concept of national cultural autonomy to include territorial autonomy as well. But it would not be a territorial uh, autonomy in the sense of a state, where a state has exclusive control over the territory and uh, determines uh, that, that there is uh, a separation principle involved, as the Zionist you know, theoretician Yabotinsky talked about. He's the one who proposed the Iron Wall, the famous Iron Wall concept to separate the two nations. And uh, we find this Iron Wall has actually been constructed, only it's hidden inside the cement, you know, of the separation barrier that is, uh, been, that is still in the process of being constructed. In fact, you know, this wall is proposed to be constructed not only uh, along the 1967, uh, close to the 1967 border, but this is supposed to envelop the whole Palestinian territories, excluding the Jordanian Valley, which is to be annexed to the State of Israel, forming a, uh, an enclosure which has no frontier with any uh, external uh, international border, so that the uh, population of this uh, proposed uh, autonomous Palestinian territory under the two-state solution provisions is actually an enclosure within a fence that is uh, totally dependent upon the whim of the uh, State of Israel. And then the Jordanian Valley is to be annexed as well. So, but this is not, you know, usually uh, um, uncovered, you know, in the proposition that has been made, you know, by the uh, Zionist authorities when they talk about uh, recognition of the Palestinian Authority. But it is the most uh, pernicious aspect of this uh, proposal. Yeah, I like the, it's very nice. Um, my question would then be, um, so since a lot of rhetoric that comes out of Israel that I see is that uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish nation depends on the survival of the Jewish state. And that's, that's what's used. So then the question is, all of the forces that generate that rhetoric make it what's, what seems to be what's trying to be accomplished. Uh, are they likely to slide over to this picture? What's required to get them to listen to your picture? Or is it uh, a good idea that's doomed to fail because of the real forces in the region? Well, um, we have seen the, uh, the lack of appeal of this proposition to the Jewish people because two thirds of the Jewish people have refused to go and live in Israel. They do not consider their security to be dependent upon the state of Israel. Do they consider the state of Israel to be essential for their uh, escape mechanism? If they are faced with a fascist power rising in the United States of America that is uh, out to rid, uh, to make New York a Judenrein, you know, uh, would they then flee to Israel and then be saved, you know, in such a circumstance? No, because even the Nazis had 
provisions for occupying the territory of Palestine if they had actually succeeded uh, and had won that battle of El Arash there against, um, you know, between Rommel and, uh, and uh, that uh, English general. Montgomery. Montgomery, yes. Okay, if that battle had turned otherwise, yeah. the Nazis would have marched right into uh, Palestine and the Jewish population of, uh, of, of ancient times and the Zionist colonies, you know, that have come into there would have been subject to the will of women of the Nazis, you know. So what kind of security does that provide? The security of the Jewish people rests upon the international struggle against fascism. And this struggle, you know, cannot be accomplished, you know, by some, you know, mini-state, you know, like in the land of Canaan there, you know, under the auspices of the Zionist powers. Surely, you know, it is a matter of international concern. And uh, just as the, uh, the survival of humanity is based upon the fight against fascism, you know, the survival of the Jewish people is dependent upon the fate of humanity and not uh, isolated from humanity as such. We are a component of humanity, and our fate is dependent upon that fate of humanity as a whole. And uh, as such, you know, the Zionist project is not capable of ensuring the security of the Jewish people. <coughs> not only that, but in fact the Zionist project, I might add, undermined the security of the Jewish people by a de facto collaboration with the Nazi authorities at the time. I might point out even Avram Berg, who left Israel and denounced the Zionist project in a post-Zionist manner, which is somewhat popular these days, in his book, he refers to his father, who was a German Zionist, and he congratulates his father in this book for having collaborated with the Nazis to ensure that the 60,000 Zionists of Germany were able to escape and go and found their project in the land of Palestine while leaving the rest of the million German Jewish population to the mercy of the Nazis. Mm. Mm. I mean, this is, you know, what, a Zionist, you know, proposal for the interests of the Jewish people? No. Zionism is basically a statist ideology. Now, when they talk about security, they're talking about the security of the state, not about the security of the Jewish people, and not about the security of the Israeli Jewish population either. We have a totally disjunct, you know, uh, in terms of conception. The same phenomenon occurred in Hungary with the Katzner affair, with Katzner, a Zionist organizer, uh, paid off the uh, Nazis to have a train of uh, 2,600, you know, uh, Hungarian Jewish uh, people leave the territory there in exchange for keeping quiet and not warning the rest of the Hungarian Jewish population about their deportation to death camps. And in addition to that, the other example that I might point out is that uh, there was some initiative of the Hungarian Jewish uh, uh, civil society who were trying to arrange for buying off the, the Nazis to stop the deportations to, de to the death camps uh, at a time when the, uh, when the Nazis were uh, vulnerable they realized that they, they might not have won the war, and therefore they were amenable to the idea of uh, finding uh, uh, some way to, uh, to uh, ensure their own personal security and survival by means of monetary uh, compensation for stopping the uh, continuation of deportations. And this proposition, which was put forward to the Zionist movement, was left in advance, and, there was, and this uh, agreement was uh, dropped, and as a result, the rest of the remaining uh, Hungarian Jewish population was sent off to the death camps, even while the Nazis were losing the war. And the, the Holocaust was a war within a war. So the Nazis were fighting a war against the Jewish people as a, a prominent a national entity in order to ensure the future composition of their nation states, so that Germany would be Juden right. This they achieved. That war they won, even if they lost the larger war against the Soviet Union. As for the participation of the uh, Occidental countries in that war, that was largely irrelevant. Oh, well. 
in political terms, not in uh, not in uh, military terms. Okay, they they hated the uh, the fight against Nazism, but in terms of uh, uh, significance, the uh, Occidental participation in the war from the United States uh, of America, in particular, came late, and to their own interest, and had nothing to do with stopping the Holocaust. If you don't have any questions, then we can switch to the film. Yes, let's let's see the uh, the this documentary uh, was a collaboration between myself and uh, Mustafa Sisi, a Palestinian filmmaker in Nablus. What happened to the other uh, the presentations that were going to happen? That we're going to we were going to have. This one was made yesterday, and the other one was cancelled. Oh, that's for the we don't have any. That's for the afternoon session. You have to call the names, yes, so that everyone knows. Yes, yes. After the film, you know, you should call. Mm -hmm. so uh, in fact, we were. Uh, we have the list of yes, Skara Sherwin, MA University of Alberta, and was supposed to present uh, on the brink. Why not Nepal? And second is Andrew A. Conte, MBA, MA, candidate, International Affairs. And who was supposed to present unlocking the potential of religious peace building, enhancing the Afghan reconciliation process? So you should ask, are you here? Uh, uh, are you here? I mean, by any chance? <laughs> that looks like that looks like and you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so if not, then we have the last presentation this one. So they just didn't show up. I well, just, Andrew was here all the time. Yesterday. He was yesterday and day yeah. before he was here. Throughout. There was an Andrew Good. Well, Conte. Oh. He's tall, slim guy. He was sitting in the back a couple of times at the time here. Did uh, he present? Yeah, he presented on the internet. No, 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 no. No, no, was no it was not that. No. No. And that was Robert Rattle from the yeah. 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 That was Robert Rattle. But neither Andrew Conte. So, well, since this clarification okay. is being well, sought, uh, just before uh, so, mm -hmm. let me then uh, do the housekeeping part. You know, my paper was to conclude with Mrs. Errol Cole's lunch. Great. But she's not around here, but she's supposed to take us. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Did you notice my conclusion is lunch with you? My paper's conclusion is written there. Conclusion of Sri Shiva's paper, lunch with Errol Cole. Yeah. Like I put the address down there, I marked it down there. Oh, where? Uh, I, I marked the address down at the entry. 272 King Street. Where, where did you write? Where did you write? I think what? Where did you write the address? I, I, I put it on the table. I just did oh, on the table. Oh, all right. right Great. Two, 272 I'm, King Street North. Yes, I can explain that what it was going out the main oh. entrance. What goes up University yes. Avenue? until the intersection of King Street. Yes. Then you cross the road, turn left, and it's 272 King Street North, and it's Morty's Pub. Okay. <laughs> what you want to know that? You can have your lunch. M-O-R-T-Y? Thank you. M-O-R-T-Y? Yes, M-O-R-T-Y. That's well, correct. So it's, it's and quite I simple. I take yeah. that downstairs. Then. Yeah, in terms of instructions, it's quite simple. Just go on University Avenue, yeah. outside, yeah. right? Yeah. Go down to the meet King's mm -hmm. Street. Yes. Cross the street and there is a restaurant. And then go left. Second or third, one of those. It's down there. So simple, go mm -hmm. once you meet King Street, okay. which is the only set of lights, no, second set of lights. Which way, east or west? The, uh, right, you turn on your right. Yeah. I don't know whether it's east or west. And everybody buys their own food and drink. Yes. <laughs> okay, I don't so, really so that's one part of the housekeeping. The second part, because uh, um, some people are not here, um, I wish to thank you for being very productive uh, participants in both intellectual sense as well as in camaraderie and solidarity for peace research and peace research community. And uh, so we will meet, as I said, uh, Hopefully, some of you will do reach uh, Victoria, um, the University of Victoria. Conference. The yes, University conference, Victoria. Yeah. I was professor there three times, so <laughs> there's a reason. <laughs>
Okay, good. And any other announcement you wish to make? Because this is the last opportunity. Uh, Professor Edmund Priest was going to make a wonderful presentation in case uh, a paper, in case uh, we uh, we need us. But I think we are always 24 minutes late, plus 15 minutes for the film. But I wish to thank him for his offer. It would have been a very nice presentation. But uh, the. We'll because reserve get, it for Victoria. You'll get to read it in, the, in the, one of the journals. Um, uh, from, as a member of the Waloria community, I just want to thank you all for coming and for your presentations and for thank you. Being here. So thank you. So we can just, after the film, we can uh, simply oh, no, walk, yeah. you know, get out, come, come on University Avenue, and then uh, walk down on the right hand side. We, we meet the king and after that is probably first, second, third verse. Yeah, 